All right, well, it's 4.01, so I think we'll just go ahead and get started and people will continue to kind of stroll on in. So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Brian Gibson and I am one of the editors in our music education division here at GIA. Uh, and this afternoon I'm joined by John Feyerabend, Karen Howard and David Rankin. Uh, to discuss distance and online learning during this period of the, you know, the coronavirus pandemic, and also to take a look at the revision of the first steps in music curriculum. And I think we're also going to look a little bit at Karen Howard's first steps in global music book as well. So I'll be moderating the webinar, but really I'm going to turn it over here in just a few minutes to these three, our panel. Uh, but before we get started, I just wanted to cover a few logistical items. Uh, first, wanted to let everyone know that we are going to be recording this webinar and then we'll be posting it to our GIA Facebook page and also our YouTube channel uh, afterward. Uh, so if there are folks you know who weren't able to join us uh, during this time, please feel free to share that out. And I believe you'll also be getting uh, an email letting you know when that has been posted. Um, so as many people as possible, the better. Uh, also, as I mentioned, feel free to put your name, where you're from, and uh, what you teach in the chat, which is scrolling through very fast right now. Uh, that'll kind of let us know everybody who's here. And then this is important. If you do have a specific question for someone on the panel as we're going through, there is a special Q&A section down at the bottom of your screen. And if you'll type in your question there with your name, uh, I'll actually be moderating that throughout the discussion, and then we're going to save about the last 15 minutes of the hour to have a Q&A uh, session with the panelists. And so I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions. Uh, I'll get to as many as we can, but it is only 15 minutes. So I'll kind of chime in panelists around that 45-minute uh, mark to uh, begin that. And then also just want to kind of do a quick plug here. Of course, uh, Karen Howard is the author of First Steps in Global Music, which is a fantastic collection of songs and rhymes from around the world. And it goes extremely well with the first uh, steps in music curriculum, as you, as you can imagine. Uh, we're also gonna be hearing more about the revision of the first steps in music curriculum, which uh, I had the pleasure of working with John on for the last few months. Uh, and, and so that has really been wonderful. We also revised the three CDs that go along with that, took a few tracks out and also added a few new tracks in. Uh, and that, uh, the, the new curriculum book and the CDs are going to be available this Friday. Um, and uh, we're actually offering a coupon code uh, if you would like to purchase the revised curriculum book. It's 10% off. And I'm going to actually type this into the chat now. The coupon code is all lowercase first steps. So I've just added that to the chat. We'll see how long it stays there. But uh, that's the coupon code for 10% off, and that's either for the curriculum book or for the bundle, which is the curriculum book with the CDs. So those item numbers are 5880 for the curriculum book, and then that bundle with the CDs is G-7001, for those of you who need to know. Um, another important thing, if you're a teacher who currently has the first steps in music curriculum, and you want to know what the differences are between the old version and the revised version, there is actually, um, I'm going to post a link in the chat right now that'll give you a download to the supplement that gives you all the new material that was added. So you can see and you'll be right on track with everybody else who is getting the revised curriculum. And I've just posted that as well. Uh, and then last thing to kind of say about this, uh, we are also revising six of the supplemental book of books. So book of echo songs, Book of Call and Response. Um, and those actually just went to press yesterday. It was very exciting. And we're planning to have those roll out in about six weeks from now, all at the same time. Um, so that is kind of uh, everything there. And uh, before, we, before I turn it over to John and the other panelists, I just wanted to give you a, a brief introduction for each of them. So John Feyerabend, Dr. John Feyerabend, is considered one of the leading authorities on music and movement development in children. His curriculums, First Steps in Music, and Conversational Solfege have provided thousands of teachers and their students with the materials and techniques to help build community through music by evoking enthusiastic participation. His approach strives for all people to become tuneful, beatful, and artful through research-based and developmentally appropriate pedagogies that use quality literature. Karen Howard is an associate professor of music at the University of St. Thomas, teaching music education methods, core graduate courses, world music pedagogy, and advising master's theses. 
Dr. Howard is a national and international clinician specializing in children's music culture, ethnomusicology, creative and folk dance traditions, early childhood music education, assessment, and curriculum development. And David Rankin is from Kingston, Ontario, Canada, and has been teaching in schools, community organizations, and historic sites for more than 20 years. David has both piano and organ certification and is the former organist for the Kingston Frontenac's OHL franchise. As a certified teacher trainer in First Steps in Music and Conversational Solfege, David is a frequent clinician and presenter throughout Canada and the United States. And so with that, I'm going to now turn things over to John. And like I said, I'll kind of chime back in around the 45 minute mark. John? That's all right. Well, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. I have a few slides to start with. Let's see if I can get the right one up here. Oh, good. The very first time I'm trying this and it's not what I want. All right. So that is not off to a very good start. Um, what happened to it? It's gone. All right. So I'm going to talk for a bit while I hedge my bets while I try to open up this. <laughs> What happened to it? That's too funny. Um, anyway, um, let's talk a little bit about the new edition. The new edition, um, be, last year at this time, there were some concerns about repertoire that frankly I had no idea about, and I think a lot of people didn't. I think it caught a lot of us by surprise that um, there was repertoire that was not appropriate for the public schools. And I, you know, as an ethnomusicologist, there's a certain amount of collecting of repertoire that uh, you don't pay attention to any of its background because it needs to be collected for historical reasons. And I think in my background, in my Kodai folk song research training, I was collecting songs for the ethnomusicological purpose of preserving folk songs for all of its intents. I was trusting teachers to make the choices for whether or not they felt the songs were uh, appropriate for their schools or not. Um, but it turns out that teachers were asking me for more guidance and I was remiss in providing that. So this was a year long effort to try to go back through the materials to say, all right, well, while these songs have ethnomusicological relevance and there's historical relevance, even in their, their bad meanings, there's relevance to why they existed. Um, they probably don't belong in elementary school or preschool uh, materials because they could, teachers may not uh, know their background and may not knowledgeably um, use the songs in a way that uh, they feel good later when they find out about it. I hear often from teachers, I find out later that the song had this other meaning and I wish I hadn't used it. So uh, what we did was uh, gather a committee together at FAME, a, a DEI committee, and we, uh, uh, established guidelines for what songs could and could not uh, have to be included in uh, our publications. Um, and when we went through all of the publications and tried to remove the songs that were um, not appropriate to elementary and preschool settings, and then replace those songs with songs that we felt were appropriate for preschool and elementary settings. Um, and in the process of doing this, uh, a, a, an issue came up that needed to be dealt with. And I, I, I don't know that everyone's dealing with it, but because First Steps in Music is a curriculum that is meant for preschool and beyond, we had to take into consideration three and four and five-year-olds and their ability to grasp other languages. So while we would like to say we would like all children to know about musics from all the global uh, uh, environments, uh, three, four, and five-year-olds are just learning their first language, and uh, I, I wasn't certain that it was going to be helpful to introduce them to dozens of languages in dozens of songs from dozens of cultures. So I resorted to my, uh, my training in Kodai. In my training in Kodai, uh, Kodai had a, a philosophy about sharing music from cultures. Now, in Hungary, of course, the culture is pretty homogeneous. They are Hungarians, although uh, German was the official language until the mid 30s. So most Hungarians both knew German and Hungarian. But Kodai said, the first thing you want to do is to teach the music of your people. And in Hungary, that would be the folk songs of Hungarians. And then he said, you go to the next nearest neighbors. So you first need to know who you are 
before you can uh, discover how you are the same and different from your neighbors. So first you have to know musics that are based on the language you speak. And then in Hungary, the next nearest neighbors are Germany and Romania and Croatia, and they learn those musics. And as the children progress in their discovery of musics in other cultures, they become more and more distant. And so the most distant cultures, the ones that have more than 12 half steps in a scale, you know, 15 half steps in, a, in an Arabic scale or uh, Indian scale, those would be the final ones because those would be the most distant, the most unfamiliar to uh, the culture that you have. So this guidance that Kodai gave, you start with teaching the culture that your, your school children speak or sing, and then you go to the next nearest neighbors. It's great for homogeneous cultures, but of course we are not a homogeneous culture. We are a heterogeneous culture with many cultures. And so there's no way for me to know the school population that you teach in. So right from the very beginning, um, what is central to First Steps in Music is for teachers to know that we are not telling you any songs to teach. We are providing some songs that work for the pedagogical purpose, but we are challenging teachers to find out about the music of their school community. So in every school, there has to be a common language, uh, even in schools that are bilingual, there is a language that everybody speaks. And we will use songs that use that language because you can't build a community unless there's some common language for us to connect. And then we can build a community through that common language. But then what's important and what we're able to do in this country is to then uh, look at uh, songs in your school community that are um, unique to your school. And here's where the teachers have to do their work. So I'm hoping that I can pull up in a second um, this uh, slideshow, if I can get back to my, my, my thing here. It looks like I can. Just hang on for one second while I click around here. I think I can do this now. I found it. Um, why are you not there? There it is. All right, so, phew, that took a little bit. So um, give me one more second, slideshow. Show current slide. There's three buttons I have to push. Play from current slide, and there it is. So uh, this is our, our thing. So in First Steps in Music, we are expecting that the teachers will gather songs from their school. While I have a lot of materials and I offer uh, songs and rhymes that teachers can use to accomplish the eight parts of the First Steps in Music curriculum, they are only songs that are um, appropriate for those people that speak English. If you are in a school situation where there is another language that is being shared, a uh, French English school, a Spanish English school, a school with a large Japanese population, and on and on and on, it's the teacher's responsibility to find out what are the songs that those people know. GIA has a magnificent publication called the Family Folk Song Project that Kathy Ward wrote, and she walks teachers through how to do this. The concept here is that you invite the students to bring songs into the classroom from their families. So this is how teachers can find out what are the songs that are relevant to their school community. Not only the songs that we're going to be sharing that are of a common language, probably English, but also songs that are of a majority of the children. And you may have more than one population in your school that needs to be shared. So the teacher needs to gather songs from the families by asking the children to bring in songs and then to use those songs wherever they can be uh, appropriately fit in. They might be a song that'll be good for steady beat. They might be a call and response song. They might be a song tale. They might be a song that you can use for literacy, for uh, quarter note, two eighth notes, or for do, re, mi. Who knows? When the teachers gather the songs, they will be able to responsibly share songs and build community in their school with the people that attend their school. So while Hungary can just use Hungarian folk songs as their primary basis, in America, we or United States, we have to find songs that fit two purposes, the songs that we will have, that will unify us through our language, English, and then the songs that will 
help us understand the communities that attend the school. And then communities can learn each other's songs. So if your school has a Spanish and a Japanese community, you should include both Japanese and Spanish songs so the, ja the, the students will become uh, uh, knowledgeable of the community through music that the Japanese people use, or the community through music that the Spanish people or the Latinos use. Um, so it's the teacher's responsibility to gather the songs of the community of the school. And we've done our very best to give you some options for that. Because First Steps in Music is for preschool and beyond, it became a challenge for how are we going to do this in language when children are barely learning a first language. So I'm, what we did was resort to the second most common culture, and which was Latin. So we used a lot of songs from this publication that GIA has, and we included them. We removed songs from First Steps in Music that uh, were offensive, uh, and we replaced them with songs that were more, mostly from this book. Um, that allowed us to put in echo songs and call and response songs and finger plays um, and steady beat games that were uh, Latino uh, or Latina for us to use in the First Steps in Music book. So in the book, we have the supplement. Brian's going to put this uh, in the chat room. And we now have created a supplement. Uh, this particular one is not Spanish, uh, but the rest of the songs are uh, Latino. And uh, the teachers will be able to get this for free. And this will be uh, Spanish supplemental songs that you can use in the preschool, First Steps in Music preschool and beyond. But I do want to be helpful. We want to be helpful for uh, teachers that have other cultures. Well, um, I, I didn't want to put in First Steps in Music all cultures because that would, be, that would send a wrong message to teachers. It would send a message that all teachers should teach all these languages to four-year-olds. And that's just not true. Four-year-olds can learn their first language and then maybe songs of a related culture. And then gradually, as they become five-year-olds and six-year-olds and seven-year-olds, we go to the next nearest neighbors and the next nearest neighbors. And we add more and more cultures as the children progress through elementary school. So we did suggest some songs from other publications, two other publications that are very helpful uh, from other cultures besides Latino publications are from Roots and Branches and from Karen Howard's First Steps in Global Music. So in each unit in First Steps in Music, we reference songs from these two books that are appropriate for the fragment singing section, the simple song section, the steady beat section. And they're listed like here. So for, this is from the finger play, I'm sorry, this is from the finger play and action song chapter. And it says, for more global references, check out these songs from Roots and Branches and from, Sis, or from uh, Karen's global music book. So there are other places that we can send you to if you are looking for songs from other cultures. But we didn't feel we should put all these cultures right in the book. So the book is mostly English and Latino songs. And if you would like to have additional cultures, they're referenced at the end of every chapter of where you can find songs from other cultures. So here's the, at the end of the Steady Beat uh, chapter and more where you can find more global references at the end of the Steady Beat chapter. And so, John, can I jump in here really quick? With the, with the Roots and Branches material, we did end up incorporating that into some of your supplemental book of materials. So this is a slightly uh, older draft of the of the book but the stuff that's in red down there that people can see and uh, we actually did get permission from that publisher of roots and branches so uh the uh the supplemental book of books will have these songs like teapock and yo mama na yo uh in those which is really great now the the stuff from first steps in global music that is just in karen howard's book um so i just wanted to make sure people knew that they would have access to some of this stuff uh through gia Beautiful, beautiful. All right, and so uh, there's one other reference I wanted to share with people. Uh, this particular website, um, uh, uh, I, I, it's a long website, look at this, golly gee. Um, this is a person who has uh, 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 put together ideas, and I'm really impressed with the ideas that she has done, mu making music memories um, of when you bring your students back to the classroom, 
how are you going to have classes where they are socially distanced and how are you going to have classes where they can't sing and they can't move? And she's provided a variety of really wonderful ideas for all eight parts of things that you can do in the classroom. Um, so we're, we actually are talking about two different things, aren't we? We're talking about if you're teaching online, how can you make this come to life online? And if you are also in a hybrid situation where your students are going to be coming to a classroom, this particular uh, set of ideas, um, and maybe Brian, you can cut and paste this link into the chat room so that people can easily uh, uh, do that. Or maybe I'll do it. So yeah, I'll I think you might be able to, John, because I can't. All right. Uh, so uh, from here, uh, I'm a little ahead of myself. So I'd like to go back to Karen Howard now. And Karen, um, you wrote this book to help us uh, understand how we could bring more global music into the First Steps in Music curriculum. And it's a fantastic collection. So I wonder if you'd like to take a few minutes now to share with us um, what you have in this book and why it's relevant, especially at this time. Sure, thank you so much. Um, I, I agree with the way you were stating things that really nobody knows your school communities like you do, all of those of you that are tuned in with us today. And there are so many facets to that knowing, right? There's you and your identity as a teacher, your, your upbringing, your race, your first language, your other languages, your interest in other cultures. And then there's your school community. Who makes up your school community? Is it a predominantly white school? And if so, do those students not also deserve a diverse experience, right? And so there, all of the things happen at one time and they're all true at once. All of these things that seem that they should conflict with each other, right? And, and yet we as the music teachers regardless of race, are expected to be able to bring all of these things in to our music classrooms without having had that training. And so as a, as a university um, methods professor, I'm, I'm trying to, it, it means giving up deeply held uh, trainings in my own life, um, you know, decades of the way I was taught piano and the way I sang in choir and, and the way I emphasized notation and really thinking about um, sending out a batch of music teachers that are less intimidated by things than I was uh, back in the early 90s when I, when I first started teaching. And, and part of what the intention was for this book was really to share the sort of work that I'd been doing since the early 90s. Um, you know, when, when we were, I saw some people from Simsbury, Connecticut. I used to teach there. I taught in East Hartford and we were piloting some of John's curricular projects. And, you know, I, I understood the, the framework, but some of the songs weren't my cup of tea, right? That's how music is. We, some, we like this, we like that. For me, even as a new teacher, I didn't, I didn't like to teach songs that were very uh, heterogeneous or heteronormative. I didn't like the assumption that I wanted to marry. Uh, you know, I, I always bristled at those. And so, uh, or I certainly didn't want to teach one about smoking or, you know, uh, uh, being lascivious or, or uh, sexualizing a, a female character or, you know, even though I love the murder ballads, why are these sisters killing each other over some man and um, those sorts of songs. So I would find a different song tale. My friends and I, we would sing The Wind and the Rain together, you know, when we'd gather for our song making. And, and then in my classroom, I would find something that, that seemed less controversial. Or songs that, I, you know, I started teaching before the internet was a thing. As John was speaking, I remembered when I was getting my master's, we were learning about the internet. And I remember saying to the person next to me as we were typing, where does this go? Where, where, is, where is this internet? So what we relied on when we did our song research, my generation and the generations before me, we relied on liner notes. We relied on people that went before us, ethnomusicologists who at that time were predominantly white men researching other cultures, which happens. And we relied on those notes as Bible or fact or, or, or the ultimate truth and, and really didn't question that. And, and we, th that created layers and layers and layers of teachers that 
no longer questioned where the songs come from because they were being brought to them by trusted mentors, myself being one of those. And I passed along some of these things until I started to understand, okay, the more I travel, the more I study, the more I get to know people and interview them and talk about the backgrounds of songs, the more I realize that what I've been relying on is, is incomplete. And I, nor am I saying there's ever a complete. That I may have researched something deeply and, and it's, it took me in a direction that I don't yet know today is inaccurate. So to the best of my ability, I, if I found out that a song was of a, a tradition that was connected with racism, I would take that song out, find other things. That's lucky us. There are so many songs, and I would I would replace it. Uh, or if I had, as John said, you know, who's in your school, who's in your community, I would find songs. Or the best is when you get invited to somebody's house, right? If you can find a way to get the families to have you over, and then you see the songs in their settings at the dinner table or at tuck-in time, or what stories are they singing? What lullabies are they sharing? What knee bounces do they they remember? Uh, what clapping games did they play? Uh, and, and start to build those collections. So that was really um, the intention of this book. And I will mention, if I may share my screen, is that is this an appropriate time for me to jump? Okay. Yes. yes. Let me do that. Uh, it's offering me strange choices, which I'm not going to talk to. I don't know what those choices are about. Okay, I will jump here. Yes. Okay, so um, one of the things I wanted to say is that there are recordings included with this book on the website, but uh, we are working on making this more obvious to you. This, this, this is where all the recordings are. This little subtly marked thing, which we're going to try and make more obvious. and. This was a new idea, a new sort of book, and, and I didn't really have a personal budget. Things are a little different now. I think we're aware there is an audience for this type of project, and it's safer to put some financial uh, risk into these books. But at the time, I thought, well, I don't have money to pay people from 36 countries to sing these for me, so let me work for a year to make sure that I can sing them all passably put the phonetic pronunciation in for all of the songs, put some of the pronunciation rules in. And then some people said to me, but I wouldn't mind paying if you give me a list of where can I get a recording of a native singer. And I said, oh, I thought people would mind if I said, here's a recording, but you have to buy it. So I've created a list that will be added here sometime soon, uh, showing places where you can go so you can hear me for free or within the cost of your book, or I'm sending you some are YouTube links and some are recordings that you can buy of native uh, speakers and singers. Some are friends of mine that, that uh, worked with me, which brings up a new sort of transparency that is expected around work with, especially if you are a white person, with people from outside of your race or outside of your culture. Normally, I would not mention that people have been compensated, um, as it's in the past been a private financial transaction between me and my researchers, uh, co-researchers, but there is a new transparency that is sought out by some. I'm still getting used to it, so pardon me if I'm seeming clumsy with it, but anybody that collaborated with me they were uh, accommodated, um, uh, compensated, uh, acknowledged in, in ways that are to the standard of, of what we feel today. There, there is a lot of pushback right now towards the field of ethnomusicology in general um, um, with a similar call across educational disciplines to try and decolonize its approach as very steeped um, in, in whiteness. So, I understand all of that and am deeply uh, embedded in researching that, and yet I'm white and I still need to be able to teach music. So it's both and, it's all of it at the same time. I need to do a better job for all of my days of navigating complicated racial, cultural dynamics having to do with privilege, having to do with the academy, having to do with research ethics. And yet I still need to be able to teach those musics because I'm the only one in the room most of the time. And 
unless I win the lottery or I can just fly everybody in in a bubble because of the virus, uh, it's, it's on my shoulders. Um, just a couple of other quick uh, sites to share with you. Actually, I should be able to stay right where I am. I spend a lot of time researching recordings uh, from the Smithsonian Folkways archive. I am one of the teachers that does the certification course, course in world music pedagogy. Uh, we were not able to have our in-person course this summer and I can only hope next summer. I desperately missed that um, musicking with people. Um, if you haven't been here before, uh, some of the participants from over the last 10 years who have taken the courses in the four different locations have created free, amazing teaching ideas. Now, these are students in the course. So you might read it and think, well, why would they do that? Well, they might ask that about any of our projects, right? We're all unique and have our different approaches. So you can click here, for example, it looks like somebody did a lesson in Nigeria, uh, tells you the grades they were thinking, uh, what standards, these have not been updated to the NCAS standards. Um, it links you to the recordings they thought were interesting, etc. And one other thing, especially for those that are younger, let me just pull up any recording here. I mentioned liner notes before. Uh, we don't really have liner notes anymore, but I wanna make sure that you don't miss them because some unpaid intern, oh, let's see, it won't, it's not opening nicely for me, there we go. Some unpaid intern hand scanned all of these liner notes in so that you can have them for free. And look how subtle that is, right? So if you click on the download the liner notes, people my age and older, this is what we expected, right? I want the stories, I want the pictures, I want the choreography for the dance, I want that handwritten sketch of the of the long waist formation with the variations and such. So don't forget to check the liner notes. Also, Alan Lomax's Global Jukebox, which unfortunately he did not li live to see in this iteration, but uh, it has his entire uh, online archive available to scroll through. Um, I don't have time to actually tell you about all of that because I just wanna make sure two other quick things, so I don't take too much time. One is that somehow I magically convinced with some help, <laughs> convinced GIA that starting a new series and allowing me to be the editor was a great idea. And it's called World Music Initiative. And nobody knows more than me that world music is a complicated, problematic term. But this series considers all music, world music, all. So we're not just talking non-Western, non-white but the emphasis will be on lesser represented musics. So I saw somebody ask, when is that book of Chinese songs coming out? Uh, we have three projects coming out, one in, in a couple of months, uh, up to Brian, <laughs> when, when we finish that one, we're working. That is a collaboration uh, with my teacher, Kwasi Dunyo from Ghana, uh, um, a whole collection of songs that will be coming out and arranged in different teaching ideas for you for elementary. Then the collection, um, all of these books will be with somebody from the culture paired with a music teacher and they might both be music teachers. Uh, and another one of um, Somali children's songs. So um, all coming out in the next few months to closer to a year. Um, I feel like that was everything that I wanted to share and I probably talked too long. So thank you for the opportunity to tell you about those things. Thank you, Karen. And Karen's, Karen, your materials are such a godsend to all of us. Uh, I can't thank you enough. Um, and for me personally, to know that it's not just uh, an ethnomusicologist that knows how to gather materials that are valuable, but also you've taught first steps in music and you've taught these children and you know that these materials will work with this age and, and, and you've, you've done it. So it's not just ivory tower talk, it's, it's the real deal you walk the talk and there aren't a whole lot of people like you. So God bless you, Karen, and thank you for all you've done for us, especially for first steps and I'm all the thousand people watching here today. Thank you. Moving on to David, and I, I gave a little moment a second ago, if you have to go back to the classroom and you got that website where you can see ideas for the eight part curriculum, but David Rankin has taken it one step further, <laughs> as David tends to do. And I think you're all about to discover something that's going to blow your mind. 
Um, David has created how to present First Steps in Music curriculum online uh, in a most engaging way. I'm going to let him do all the talking about it. But um, and 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 uh, he's creating a number of these uh, episodes. Uh, the first one is free, and we'll give you a link so you can see the first one. David will talk about it. But the rest of them, you have to be a FAME member. So at the end of this talk, I'm going to put up some information that if you are interested in becoming a FAME member, uh, if for no other reason, to see the rest of David's incredible work. So with that, I know you're just all holding your breath. David Rankin, it's yours. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining all of us together uh, for this great opportunity to share how are we going to do things in these crazy times. You know, when COVID hit, uh, we were all thrown into a lurch, and we had to completely reinvent and reevaluate how we're going to help optimize children's musical development. And in my case, uh, I teach about 800 students. 34 classes, about 30 minutes a week. And we use Google Classroom. And you can imagine when you have multiple teachers all posting, you know, try this, try this, try this, try this online and asking two parents, two kids all to get together and do that every day, it can be very problematic. It would kind of be like a child going to the school at 815 and all the teachers greet this child and say, this is what you're doing today and this and this and this and this. Whoa! So I tried to create something that would be engaging, uh, that they could do on their own time, that educators could use uh, if they're doing synchronous learning online, or if you're like me and you're gonna be in a classroom with a mask and you can't sing, you can't touch, you can't move, I hope we can breathe, uh, you could still uh, do music with your children to the best of our abilities. So I've been doing green screen technology and I've had numerous grants under the uh, title Building Community Through Music for the last few years. And so when I was forced home uh, into what I call the cabin in the woods, I do live in, in the woods, while I was boiling maple syrup for two weeks, I came up with the idea that why don't we try and create something that embodies everything that First Steps is and it's as engaging as Lomax, The Hound of Music, which is a hit with all of my students. So I started, I brought the green screens home, I set them up and I started making lists of the favorite material that we did with students. And I just started filming my, my, my kids, you know, would help with the editing and the tech. And then after I had all, all these segments, I had about 60 recordings, I thought, how am I gonna piece them together? Well, let me show you how I pieced it together, and thanks to the committee that helped come up with the title, Mr. Rankin's Music Cabin. So this is the opening. That is not the opening, Mr. Rankin. Can you please go back and try that again? Sure, let's try this. We will try that again. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, there were students from all over the world who explored a new way of doing music class. It was full of singing, movement, and fun. Building community through music. Let's go to the cabin to sing, say, dance and play in a tuneful, beatful and artful way.
Hey kids! Oh, it's great to see ya. I was just out fishing for some mud cat when I heard you pull up to the cabin. I didn't catch any fish today. I think they were social distancing. Uh, especially from my bait. But, of course, that's why they call it fishing and not catching. But on today's episode of the Tuneful, Beatful, and Artful Music class, we're going to warm up our voices and do some echo songs and games, some movement exploration. We're going to go on an adventure through the wormhole. And, of course, we're going to end with a song tale. So, that's, that's the opening for about five of the ten episodes. And there are segments from everything from pitch explorations through Ariosa land to song tales. And it's all done in a way that evokes a response. So children, students, adults, who's ever taking part are not just sitting there staring at a screen that we're all sick of doing, but hopefully they'll be standing, moving, using their voices and creating. So here's another one. Let's do a little uh, echo song uh, with a Good vocal model. If we can find child models, we'll do that. And this is my daughter, Eva. Let's take a look in the spotting scope. David, to see if we can find out where it's going to happen today. Are you ready? Sorry about that. No, uh, you have to, uh, the green box has to be around what you want us to see. God, well, let's try that again. I have a blue box. <laughs> there you go. Well, not the recycle box, but a blue box. There you go. Thumbs up. Perfect. Let's take a look in the spotting scope. to see if we can find out where it's going to happen today. Are you ready? Now you sing after me. Those were two examples. Uh, uh, there's there are about twelve different movements, and there's folk dancing, uh, and everything can ad be adapted, or pretty much can be adapted for all the unique situations. You know, I was teaching a webinar last week, and and one of the most common questions was, "What are we going to do if we can't sing?" And I, I my answer was always the same: have a, a musically rich environment. You know, language, or developing that musical intelligence is an aural phenomena. And even if the children can't even hum in their mass, if they have those good vocal models and they're hearing, um, then they're still going to develop a lot more than they could be if, if they were not taking part in musicking together. So this is the first episode. It is published on the FAME website under the Tuneful, Beatful, Artful Music class down on the side. And there are nine more that go through uh, all the more complicated uh, song, song fragment, fragments, call and response song. And there's four episodes that are specifically designed to go with conversational solfege. So from everything from some of the echo games and rhythm walks you might do, um, right up to synchronizing notation with classical music. I incorporate folk music as well. So I hope that you can use this or share this with your students so that you can enrich them into a tuneful, beatful, and artful experience uh, this fall.
Thank you, David. They, it, they're, it's just exceptional what you have done. So I wanted to just go back uh, for one more second back to uh, this PowerPoint. Um, let's see if I can get over. So uh, here uh, you can see these episodes at this website, firerobinmusic.org. Uh, that is our fame website. And, uh, but you can only see episode one. If you would like to see all of the episodes, you have to be a member. And good news, if you decide to become a member after this webinar, you get a 10% discount by putting in the code 2020 FireAbend. So normally it's $60 and it will only be $50 if you want to join the organization. But really, it, it, it's worth it just to get David's videos, but there are move -its there. There are amazing materials to download. Uh, it is a really rich website full of relevant materials for teachers that are looking for uh, online resources. But no one has done what David has done. David has taken this to a new level of professionalism um, that involves evoking responses from the viewer. And you can either use his videos as they are, I would, and you could also get ideas from his videos so that you could create your own online teaching using techniques that he's using in the classroom. Uh, David, did you want to add anything else to that? Or Karen, did you want to add anything else before we open it up to Q&A? Oh, David, you're muted. Great. My goal is not to be muted three times. It's only been once. Uh, I, when I created these, it's, it's my goal that children, adults will not be sitting still. Because asking a child to sit still for more than a minute is often too long. And so um, it's not something that we would expect them to do that. So maybe I should put a warning for parents. You know, your child's going to bounce around the room and they're going to want to dance with you and sing to you and create. Um, so I hope you have fun with them. And if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A or find me at the, on the Fire Oven Fundamentals Facebook page and I'll, I'll try and, and, and help you out as best I can. All right. Are you going to lead the question and answers? Yes, I will. And I've actually been getting some similar questions, a few that I think that I can actually answer. So let me just take care of those because they're kind of logistics type stuff. Um, a bunch of people are opening up the, the new supplement that they've seen and they're wondering, uh, where can I find the songs that were removed? And those songs that were removed are listed on the second page, uh, just with all the rest of the introductory material. Um, so that's where you can see, and it's only five songs. So there was some confusion about how many there were and what they actually were. And that information is in that PDF. So you can find that on page two, uh, just so everybody's clear. And then we also have some people asking about revisions that are happening to the supplemental book of books what songs, if any, were taken out of those and what songs were also added. Those just went to press and, and I'll be the one probably who ends up working on that. So it's something on my list and I need to chat with Alec, our president, about putting that together. But yes, we do definitely want to let people know what changes have been made to those six book hubs as well. Um, so just be checking back in over the next week or two here because uh, that's on my list of things to take care of. So we won't leave you guys out to dry on that. Uh, and there were several questions. Um, and I do have, I think, now some questions that I can direct to our panel. Uh, so here's a good question from Kristen McCormick. Uh, it says, how should we determine which cultures should be represented? I have a fairly large population of students from two other cultures and then a few other cultures where there are only one or two students from that culture represented in our school. What would be the best way to select songs? I, maybe I'll jump on that one. Yeah, I think yeah, there is no easy response here. Uh, we could talk a for a week on this subject because it approaches a few things. Somebody took a course with me a couple of summers ago. She teaches in Minnesota and her school population is roughly a third Mexican American, a third Somali, and a third assorted children from different white backgrounds from you know, either multiple generations. Uh, and that's very not diverse. And right, so it's basically this, this mixture of different backgrounds of white 
students, this uh, uh, Somali culture and this Mexican American culture. So she was spending a lot of time. We, we talked separately outside of class. I said, your case is interesting to me. So we talked a lot about what would be the right approach. And she started creating a collection of specifically Mexican uh, songs either from Mexico or from the Mexican American community because all of her Spanish speaking students were Mexican American. They weren't from a, a wide variety of Spanish speaking cultures. Um, and then the Somali songs, very, very hard to get, which was one of the reasons for uh, really getting this project of Somali songs moving forward. Um, and then kind of figuring out, uh, you know, what were the heritages of her white students and yet, it doesn't mean that that's what those students want to learn, right? It doesn't, somebody asked something about, well, what about the fact that so many families enjoy listening to pop music at home? Well, that may be, if you're teaching in a culturally responsive manner, that may be informative for all of your students. So there's, what are the cultures represented in your school? Being sensitive to as many or adding some if you're not culturally diverse in your school population paired with being culturally responsive, which does not mean uh, they're African American, so they must like rap, or they're Mexican American, so they must like mariachi. Those, those are not uh, statements that are accurate or, or healthy to apply to your student population. You have to get to know who they are. Um, so there isn't a, this is the number, or this is the ratio, and then you want to bring things in that are perhaps new to everybody. Right? New, and it might even mean introducing something from a culture that a student of that heritage has never heard before. That, that may be the result. So it's, it's aiming to, be, uh, to have breadth in your musical programming. Ooh, that's a week long answer in two minutes. Thank you so much, Karen. Did, any, did either of you have anything else to add, David or John, to that? No, I think Karen did it. Okay, excellent. Karen, here's another one for you, just a real quick one. How do we find that map on the Smithsonian site? Someone must uh, yeah, there's a, t I won't take the time to share it. There's a tab up at the top on the home screen that says explore. That's where you look for music. And then it says learn. If you click the learn tab, it takes you into uh, all of the materials that are related to our courses. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Karen. Um, John, maybe this would be a good question for you. Someone, uh, Susie uh, wrote, if you have limited time with your students, 20 to 30 minutes, what parts of the lessons would you focus on? Yeah, that's a good question. I get that. Uh, I think the four first singing steps have to happen in every lesson. And they go fast. So the first four, you can be done in 10 minutes. But a vocal warm up, a fragment singing, a simple song, and maybe invite them to do arioso. The others are three movements and, and uh, song tales. And the movements, you can intersperse throughout other lessons. If you don't have enough time to get to all three movement things, do movement exploration today, do finger plays next week, do steady beat the week after that. But the singing has to happen in every lesson. You can't do those occasionally. So what in a, in a shorter period of time, make sure you do the first four things, pitch exploration, fragment singing, simple songs, and arioso. Do those in every lesson, and then include whatever else you can from the rest of the parts of the eight-part workout. OK, excellent. Excellent. Uh, I've got a question from Kayla here, which I think, David, you, you touched on for the end of, of your uh, section, which is how, how do we sing when we're not allowed to sing? And I know this is kind of the question that's on a, a lot of teachers' minds at, you know, during this time. Any additional thoughts on that? Well, you know, every school is going to be different. And some you're explicitly not allowed to sing. Um, I don't know if that means you can't laugh, shout, breathe, uh, but we do need to adapt for that. And so I would still do equus. I would still do the all four parts if we're doing early primary or, or, or and beyond uh, the vocal development. And they're still gonna think it, they're still gonna hear it. But then that's something that you could do digitally and that they could, you could take the first episode, of, uh, my first episode, and they could, that something they could do on their own or record it. Um, working outside, if you're able to go outside in a group, that's one way you can do it. Um, or if there's any transitions where you're socially distanced, that maybe you could sing. Uh, and it, please post your suggestions to the Fire Oven Fundamentals because that is a, such a common question um, that 
I look forward to hearing all the other suggestions that come out of this. I, I, I would also like to add, I, I'm not positive, but I think it's okay to hum. And so in the classroom, you can have the students do the humming um, and you can use recordings where they hear your voice singing so the teacher doesn't have to be singing, yes. spitting, spitting singing, <laughs> you just use the recording, but the students, like an, a fragment song, the teacher can use the recording that's, that we have for First Steps in Music for Echo Songs, and then the students can hum back and then post it on your school website so that at home, the children then can sing with the words. So we, we would, in the classroom, hum, but tell the students, this will be on the school website tonight, I want you to go home and do it with words. Excellent. Thank you so much, John and David. And I'm seeing a few people asking questions along the lines of, and I'll be able to answer this one, uh, what kind of copyright permissions do we need to um, secure from GIA to use GIA material during this time? And uh, I'm sure a lot of you saw GIA put out that statement back in March when everything kind of closed down initially. Uh, and that is still in effect currently. And I'm actually going to post, if I can, I might actually post on the, uh, on the same page that I put the 2020 supplement, um, just that information about what you are allowed to do with the GIA material because our hope and our goal is to be very flexible for you all because we understand you're having to be immensely flexible with what your, you know, what your lesson plans are. So we don't want anything with copyright getting in the way of you all being able to um, give your students the resources and materials that they need. So uh, no, I, I will post that. Uh, I think the bottom line on that from Alec was uh, once you've purchased a product, you're able to share it like you would in the classroom. So if you had bought a, a picture book and you want to put it online and share it, it's fine because you've already bought the book and it's just as if you're sharing it in the classroom, you're sharing it online. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, John. Uh, I, I have a, another good question for David here. Several people are asking, um, how can we share David's videos with our students, especially if we're our FAME member? Uh, do we have to do, you know, screen sharing? Uh, can they do it through Google Classroom? What do you, what do you think about that, David? Um, you know, the, right now the episode on the FAME website is one, one file that's streamed. I don't know if it's available for, for download, um, but you can stream it. You can put it as a link to any online uh, platform you're using and or there is below it I have a timestamp of all the different segments all the different eight parts of the first steps curriculum that you can direct students to because I wouldn't assign you know a 30 minute uh, episode for children at home um, but maybe the first four which again lasts only about 10 minutes so that's one way to do it and uh, for fame members in the newsletter um, I think there was talk of putting uh, in individual sections, little snippets of future episodes as well that might help uh, in different situations. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, David. Uh, well, I see we have just about one minute left here, and I, I was seeing a few people asking a question of if they'll be able to uh, review this uh, webinar in the future, and the answer is yes. If you may have missed it at the beginning, but we are recording. Uh, these webinars and it will be posted on uh, the GIA Facebook page and also our YouTube channel for viewing later. You will actually, I believe you'll get an email with a link to it so you can uh, have access to it. And please also feel free to share that uh, with other teachers as well. Uh, does, do any of our panelists have any final thoughts to share before we kind of wrap this up here? Yes, Karen. I, I just want to say, David, that I think you should host a webinar where you explain how you do that. <laughs> Great Seriously, idea. Let's I, I, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Yes. Yeah. And we got a lot of, I saw a lot of comments right whenever that video was playing. Love it, fantastic, uh, you know, lots of enthusiasm there for that. Well, David and Brian, maybe we can set something up in the okay. very near future. Right. We'll, we'll chat with Alec about that because it did okay. get, it got a lot of really positive response. Okay, well, thank you to everybody who joined us today. We had an excellent turnout, well over 500 people watching for the entirety of the webinar, which is just fantastic. Uh, just want to reiterate that GIA is here for you all um, during this time. We know that teachers are some of the hardest working professionals out there dealing with some very challenging situations. Um, and we want to be here for you all in this time. Um, like I said, this will be posted on the Facebook page and the YouTube channel. 
And uh, I think that is it for us. So thank you everybody uh, for joining us today and best of luck with your school years as they continue. Yes, thank you all for showing up today. Good luck to all of you in these weird times. Yes. Big hearts. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.